everyone, it's Sam aka Ocean Unknown and welcome back to my channel. In my last video about Danganronpa Heartless Deceit, I hinted at this video and now it's time for me to discuss my predictions for who is the mastermind of this killing game. And once again, I'm cosplaying Yumeo because yeah. one, he's my only cosplay from Heartless Deceit and two, his character gives me the most creative ideas for scary makeup. Also, he's one of my favorites, so that's another reason. <laughs> Anyways, let's discuss my predictions for who will be the mastermind of Danganronpa Heartless Deceit. So in my video about my predictions for Despair Time's mastermind, I made a tier list with categories for whether or not I believe a character could be a contender for the mastermind or not. I really liked that format, so I'm continuing it, but also because Heartless Deceit has so many characters. Because this story has the main story of the killing game and the side story of Denchi getting involved with the police force in the Himura clan, we have 25 characters to discuss. So these are my Heartless Deceit tier list. Ooh. So these are my categories. On the bottom is our D tier, AKA brain the size of a goddamn peanut. Which this is basically the tier for characters who I think have zero chance of being the mastermind. We then have Yui the Toaster, aka This Theory is Toast, which is our category for characters who have a solid 5 to 10% chance of being the mastermind. Next is. Which is for characters who are a bit more suspicious than those in the Yui the Toaster tier, but they're not yet top contenders for the mastermind. After that is that one Izanami sprite, which is for characters who are very suspicious. And lastly, the devil. Which is reserved for characters who I could absolutely see being the mastermind. Now, in my Despair Time Mastermind video, I used a wheel spinner to determine the order of the characters I would talk about. But this time, I'm just going to go in the order on the official Heartless Deceit website, which is just alphabetical order for the characters in the main plot, and then the more loose order of the side plot characters. Without further ado, we're starting with the main story with our protagonist, the ultimate internet sensation and hitman, Akira. Akira Hayasaka is definitely one of the most suspicious fan game protagonists I've ever seen. Receiving two ultimate talents as both the ultimate internet sensation and the ultimate hitman, Akira's character is surrounded by questions. What kind of content does she make on the internet? How did she get involved with the Himura clan and become an assassin? Does her family, specifically her brother who was kidnapped alongside Akira at the EOS Institute, know about her second ultimate talent? And lastly, what does she mean when she says not again before being kidnapped and put into the killing game? There is also the mysterious connection between Akira and Hanako, the girl who was murdered at the beginning of the series, as for one, they are both tied in some way to the Himura clan, and two, they have the same voice actor, Ariana Rosario. First and foremost, to kind of answer one of my hypothetical questions, Hitoshi, Akira's brother, mentioned in episode one of the prologue that he skipped archery practice to attend the EOS ceremony with Akira. By the way, every time I say EOS Institute, I keep picturing those circular ball-shaped ball. lip balms. Maybe they're the real mastermind. The writers could have chosen any other activity for Hitoshi to do in his free time, but they chose archery, an activity that involves weapons and being quick and accurate in your shot. Which, when you put it that way, sounds like what Akira does as a hitman. While, of course, not everyone who partakes in archery or other activities involving weapons like color guard or fencing are violent people, but in the case of this story, the mention of Akira's brother being skilled at a weapon-based sport leads me to believe that there's something sketchy going on with her family and Akira's connection to the Yakuza. This would also make it very fascinating if Akira's family was fully aware and in support of her more deadly work since the character who is seemingly Akira's support character, Tomoya, is so connected to the police through his father. However, Hitoshi was shocked by Akira's physical strength and severe concern over the circumstances, so it's also possible that her family has no clue of her hitman work. Moving on to Akira's connection to the killing game, it's heavily speculated that Akira has been in another killing game or a very similar situation in the past, which is shown in how she responds to being trapped in the EOS Institute in episode 1 of the prologue. In which, I have a very loose theory about this. So when Akira gets kidnapped in episode 1 of the prologue, the guards are seemingly unfamiliar to her, which could imply that Akira was not kidnapped by the EOS Institute in the past, but someone else. My very loose theory is that Akira was in a previous killing game, but instead of being established using the EOS Institute, it was established by the Himura clan. From the Himura clan characters that we know of currently, there's Ryuji, the three lieutenants, Denchi, and Akira. There's also Yuki and Ryusei, who many fans of Heartless Deceit have theorized are actually dead, and Hanako, who is actually dead. So six characters that are confirmed to still be alive. Six people. 
Seems like a familiar number in relation to Ding and Rampa, right? If you thought about the six survivors of the first Ding and Rampa game, then you'd be correct. My theory is that the Himura clan hosts something similar to a killing game to determine the next leader of the Yakuza about six years ago, which led to the deaths of Yuki, Ryuze, and potentially a lot of characters that we have yet to meet that were involved with the Himura clan. Also, most notably, this could be what caused Hanako's death, or what came about as the aftermath of Hanako's death as I predict that she was in some way in a position of power in the Yakuza before her death. The survivors of the Yakuza death game are then Ryuji, the current chairman of the Himura clan, the three lieutenants in Momoka, Keisuke, and Hirotaka, Denchi, and Akira. This theory I came up with is very similar to a popular theory about a game that I really like that is very similar to Danganronpa, Your Turn to Die, where many predict that the protagonist of that game, Sara Chidoen, was put into the death game to prove that she was the right heir for a Yakuza group involved with the evil organization Asunara. Also, I should mention I want to make videos about Your Turn to Die so bad. I just need to write them. Similar to how Midori and Asunara were taken aback by how Sara in their trials ruthlessly harmed everyone and emotionally manipulated them, the Himura clan could have been shocked by Akira's tenacity and determination to survive, but also her ability to kill. This event led to the underground reformation of the Himura clan with Ryuji as the leader, but they had to keep Akira's involvement on their wraps. However, the EOS Institute likely knew about the Himura death game and kept a keen eye on Akira, considering her for the title of the ultimate ultimate hitman, along with her additional work with the Himura clan. After the Yakuza death game, Denchi, as a formal ultimate, likely told Akira to strive for a different skill to distract the EOS Institute from her work as a hitman right before she turned 18. The age ultimate titles are given out in Heartless Deceit. Thus, Akira started making content on the internet and became the ultimate internet sensation, which of course won a rise since she also was given the title of the ultimate hitman anyway. The only big hole in this theory is that this would mean that in the Yakuza death game, Akira would have only been 12 years old, but it could be likely that she was put there for unfortunate circumstances, kind of similar to Joe from Your Turn to Die. Perhaps her brother was actually supposed to be there? Who knows? Regardless, Akira definitely has something to do with the killing game and the history between the EOS Institute and the Himura clan, but I don't necessarily think she's the mastermind. I see this killing game more as a punishment for the Yakuza and as a sinister message to society of the iron grip of the EOS Institute, and they are punishing the Himura clan through Akira, and indirectly also harming Denshi by using his own creation, Ko, as the overseer of the game. I think it's more that the mastermind has it out for Akira and the Yakuza as a whole. While I don't think Akira is the mastermind, a lot of Heartless Deceit fans have speculated that she is. The main consensus around the suspicions that Akira is the mastermind is that theory that the Yakuza are the ones behind the killing game as a form of revenge for Hanako's murder. While I can see the possibilities of the Yakuza being behind the killing game, I personally see it the other way around and think the EOS Institute and the police are more involved in the killing game than the Yakuza. But because there is some evidence and good ideas for Akira possibly being the mastermind, I'm gonna put her in... <laughs> Next in alphabetical order is Chiemi Hattori, the ultimate fashion designer. Now first, I must get it out of the way that because Chiemi has a fashion-focused ultimate talent, fans naturally suspect her as a more nefarious character because of the president of fashion-focused characters in the official Danganronpa series almost always being evil. Despite this, I don't personally see Chiemi being the mastermind. I also literally hate the trope so much, like fucking be original. I feel like since Heartless Deceit's killing game is also focused on the world outside of the game with the police and the Yakuza, there's a very unlikely chance that the mastermind or even a traitor is one of the students not connected to the side plot, including Chiemi. I think the closest we might get to Chiemi having more of a dark side than she lets on is her possibly being an early game killer or her slipping up about certain things she's mentioned about her life. She clearly wants to escape the killing game and go back to her normal life, but the real question with her character is would she go as far as to kill someone for the chance to go back home. There's also a possibility that she's lying about her life back at home, which could add more to her character since as of right now, she's kind of a static character that only cares about having a good time. I will touch on this more in my full prediction video for Heartless Deceit, but I don't see Chiemi lasting very long in the killing game. Her vigorous love for life and fun, if cut extremely short, can set the tone for the story. For that reason, I'm putting Chiemi in brain the size of a goddamn peanut! Moving on to Cho Yoshida, the ultimate J-pop idol. Cho is an interesting one to rank because I have such a strong theory about her already. I have sneaking suspicions that Cho is going to become the first killer of Heartless Deceit. 
Before the release of the prologue, the pre-release videos for Heartless Deceit put a lot of emphasis on the fact that both Akira and Cho are very famous, and how this fact has affected how the public views the disappearance of the Ultimate students. A lot of them only care about the kidnappings because Akira and Cho were among the Taken. I think Cho's fame will come into play in the killing game, along with the fact that she frequently mentions in the prologue how much she wants to escape and go back to her normal life. Her bio on the Heartless Deceit website also mentions that she acts quite differently when angered, which I think will become important eventually in the story. Taking all of this into consideration, I believe Cho will set the tone of the killing game as the first killer, which will affect the side plot greatly as the public will care more about the kidnappings after losing their beloved J-pop star, especially if her last moments were not the prettiest, both in her actions and words and in her execution. With this theory, I do not believe Cho is the mastermind or is connected to the killing game in any way. So she is going in brain the size of a goddamn peanut! After Cho is Hideyoshi Kurosawa, the ultimate Taekwondo practitioner. Since none of the official Danganronpa games or any fan games, to my knowledge, have a mastermind with a sports-related talent, it's easy to follow tropes and disregard characters like Hide and say there's no way they could be the mastermind. The only exception to this that I can think of is Sakura in the first Danganronpa game being the traitor, and I guess you can count Hajime in SDRA 2 being a part of Void as him being a traitor, but I don't really see Hide being an evil character. He definitely knows a lot more than he's letting on currently, but I don't think he's holding back any information for any particular reason other than that he doesn't know everyone well enough. He knows a lot of the students due to school events, or in Katsuhiko's case, their good friends, and most importantly, Hide knows Izanami, our mystery student. Hide's mysterious past of being a delinquent could also come to play in the story, especially if certain motives expose parts of his past that he might not want everyone else to know. I'll definitely discuss this more in my full prediction video, but I think his pre-existing relationship with Katsuhiko and his knowledge on the other schools that Yumeo and Izanami and Akira went to will factor into the story, especially since a lot of the students seemingly have a lot of wealth and went to prestigious schools. I think Hideyoshi will have an early influence on the events of the story, but will likely die towards the middle and will not be the mastermind. For that reason, he's going in brain the size of a goddamn peanut! Next up is Utsume Yoko, also known as Bonnie, the ultimate game developer. I will just get this out here, Bonnie is probably the character in Heartless Deceit that I personally relate to the most, and I am very excited to see where they take her character. In my opinion, I could see Bonnie's character growth going in two directions. One, she gets a lot of positive character development and is able to speak her mind a lot more and everyone else understands her needs and are able to make her feel more comfortable. And two, her character arc is cut really short and she's an early chapter victim. I'm really hoping for the first one. However, I do want to make a loose argument about the possibility of her being a traitor. No one has discussed this possibility, so this is my own theory. As seen in her introduction in the prologue, Bonnie holds a lot of justified resentment towards her creepy fans and her sprite went telling Tomoya to shove off is eerily similar to Izanami's sprite when she asks Akira if she's hiding something. Of course, this could just be a continuity of the art style, but these are drastically different scenes and emotions between Izanami and Bonnie, so I'm questioning the choice in Bonnie's sprite for this scene. But since resentment, revenge, and deceit are large themes in the story so far, Bonnie's defensive nature could be a lot more vengeful, which is even seen when she says she wishes her creepy fans would rot in hell. While I personally don't see Bonnie being evil, I'm gonna put her in C. Yui the Toaster, this theory is toast for now. It's time! It is finally time to discuss our mystery student and my personal favorite character in Heartless Deceit, Izanami Hoshimiya, the ultimate question mark. As shown in the prologue, Izanami doesn't remember what her ultimate talent is, and it doesn't help that she's literally good at everything and anything. In the Welcome to EOS trailer, it is stated that Izanami was given a very prestigious talent that has only ever been given out once, and in the prologue, Izanami states that the EOS Institute made her take many tests to decide if she was worthy of her title, which is completely different to how the other students receive their ultimate talents. It's also clear from her conversation with Akira and Tomoya that Izanami is incredibly smart and observant as she points out everything peculiar about the situation and she seemingly knows about Akira's double life as a hitman. Additionally, she seems to have a strong sense of morality and justice as she declares that anyone she deems as a sinner will face divine judgment and punishment. Considering her behavior and how she interacts with the other characters, it's evident that Izanami is a more sinister and intelligent character amongst the students in the killing game and this will definitely come into play when everyone finds out about Akira's second talent. But to discuss how this 
plays into the topic of this video, I believe Izanami is one of the strongest candidates to be behind the killing game. While to some this may seem a little too obvious since she's the important character who's shrouded in mystery, I'm going to use some reverse psychology and say that I firmly believe that Izanami is the traitor of the killing game. As I think the killing game was set up by the EOS Institute and the police instead of the Yakuza, the motivations behind the creation of the killing game would likely be rooted in a corrupted sense of justice. If you've seen my previous video about Heartless Deceit, you know that I believe that Izanami's talent is the ultimate justice or something similar to that which perfectly ties into the motives I predict that the EOS Institute had for creating the killing game. This could also possibly mean that the killing game could be Izanami's one last test to see if she could bring justice to the world and weed out the filthy sinners, those who would end up becoming killers in the game. Izanami being the traitor could also be the reason why some of the students know each other and a lot of them are seemingly connected to Izanami. Hide and Katsuhiko know her from high school competitions, and then of course there's her history with Yumeo, which honestly might connect with something I discussed in my last video about Heartless Deceit. There's a possibility that Izanami requested the EOS Institute to reward Yumeo an ultimate title so that he could be put into the death game. Yumeo states in the prologue that he didn't want his title, and his disrespectful attitude towards everyone is only broken by Izanami as shown in the Coward Among the Gods comic I discussed in my last Heartless Deceit video. It's highly likely that Izanami had a say in who was going to be in the killing game with her, which could also be how she knows about Akira's secrets. The new Newly added information given in episode 4, Above the Yellow Spring, the episode all about the devil, aids in this theory. In the episode, the devil is given a talent that has only been given out once before, and because he rejects the ultimate title at the end of the episode, this basically confirms that he was going to be given the same talent as Izanami. However, since he rejected it, Izanami is the second person to ever be given her talent. Additionally, we see that the devil wears a dangly earring with a star on it, which we have seen before in the Coward Among the Gods on the student council president, who just so happens to be Izanami's cousin. In Above the Yellow Spring, the devil talks to his mother and aunt as his aunt says that her daughter, the devil's cousin, is far more obedient than the devil, but she has recently been spending time with a boy from some no-name family. The devil says that he encouraged his cousin to hang out with him, so it's easy to assume that the cousin is Izanami and the boy from some no-name family is Yumeo. In The Coward Among the Gods, Yumeo says that the high school he and Izanami went to was only for the wealthy and influential, or for people who are able to get accepted through stellar academic prowess. It's alluded that Yumeo got into the school through academics, so he fits the bill of the boy from some no-name family. So it's easy to make the conclusion that the devil was the student council president in The Coward Among the Gods and is Izanami's cousin. Later on in the story, the devil says, Besides, if my family could no longer control me, then she'd be their next victim. I don't want to doom her to the same fate as me. After his outburst and rejection of his title, he also says, Will she be okay? Sorry, you'll have to deal with our crazy family on your own for a little while. I'll come back to help you soon. Just give me some time to get settled. With all of this evidence laid out, the conclusion I've landed on is that he is talking about Izanami, and in a similar manner to him, she has been set up by her family to become an ultimate and a prestigious godly one at that. The sad truth that we are seeing with Izanami from what we've seen of her in the prologue is that she fully believes the indoctrination from both her family, EOS, and society as a whole about what it means to be an ultimate. I think as the story of Heartless Deceit continues, I think the devil's intentions are to expose EOS for their corrupt behavior but also to save Izanami from both the killing game and EOS, but the problem is, she's far too deep. She's truly the perfect specimen for EOS Institute, and the devil will realize, especially if she ends up being in on the killing game, that he can't save her. It's also important to note that Izanami is the only one who asks Ko about how the killing game and trial system works, and while many interpret this thinking Izanami will be a killer in the story, I personally view this action as Izanami trying to figure out how to make sure the killing game goes according to plan for EOS, and if it does, she can be awarded her talent and be the symbol for EOS like they want her to be. Like I said earlier, I think the killing game is the final test to see if Izanami is this perfect symbol of an ultimate for the EOS Institute, which is actually more similar to the Asunaru death game in Your Turn to Die than the theory I discussed about Akira, which I already compared to Your Turn to Die's death game. I must add, however, that with this theory, I don't think this necessarily means that Izanami is an evil character. I actually think she's more of a victim of circumstances. If it is revealed that she was treated in a similar way to the 
devil, I think that explains even more why she dresses the way she does because while Rimu, the director of Heartless Deceit, has said that she does like frilly dresses, I'm mostly referring to all of the star and astronomy motifs in her design. The star could be like an emblem of their family and could also be a manifestation that their family are big bright stars, shining above everyone else, rich and famous and ultimates. You might laugh because every time I sign my name I put a gold star after it, but it's a metaphor. And metaphors are important. My gold stars are a metaphor for me being a star. It's possible that EOS and Izanami's family wanted her to dress like that as a constant statement that she is only an ultimate because she followed all the rules and obeyed her family and she is their pride. I think Izanami is still stuck in the hands of her family and the propaganda EOS is feeding to the public and this is why she is involved in the killing game. She is a victim of her family and the EOS Institute and I hope as the story continues she realizes that she can be her own person just like the devil did and put an end to the killing game. In conclusion, I think Izanami Nami is definitely tied to the killing game in one way or another, and is the EOS Institute's hope for the killing game going in the direction they want it to, with an unfortunate ending for Akira and the Himura clan, and their questionable version of justice being served. While it would be fitting to put Izanami in that one Izanami sprite, the evidence for Izanami being involved in the killing game is too strong to ignore, so she is going in the devil. Moving on to our next character, we have Katsuhiko Minamoto, the ultimate debater. Being labeled the unbeatable emperor, Katsuhiko is incredibly confident in his debating skills and takes himself very, very seriously. It's stated in the story that Katsuhiko comes from a very wealthy upbringing and the creator of Heartless Deceit has implied that he is kind of out of touch with the world outside of his rich and expensive lifestyle. It is also important to note that in true Dingenrampa fashion, Katsuhiko is the one who attacks the mascot of the series when they appear and reveal the death game to the students. First and foremost, it's important to note that his talent as a whole is suspicious because of the class trial setup of the story. Naturally, a skilled debater would be better at an investigation in a class trial than, say, a weightlifter. However, because of his outburst against the killing game and his violent aggression towards Ko in the prologue, I don't think Katsuhiko is the mastermind. I'll discuss my feelings on Katsuhiko in my full prediction video, but I think he will also have a lot of character development, will be a massive highlight in the trials, whether good or bad, and will make it pretty far in the story. I see him being a late game victim or surviving, but for this video, he's going in, see Yui the toaster, this theory is toast. Next is Kyoji Fujioka, the ultimate puppeteer. Another one of my favorites from the series, I briefly talked about Kiyoshi in my last video in regards to my theory that a theme in the story will be dissecting how the characters view their ultimate titles, which correlates with my theory that the EOS Institute is one, corrupted as hell, and two, the ones behind the killing game. While many of the characters either have a distaste for their title or have something off about their circumstances of their talent, Kiyoshi's view on his talent is quite unique. Kiyoshi, while accepting of his title as the ultimate puppeteer, thinks that that his puppets, named Molly, Jack, and Cat, do all the work, and Kiyoshi often talks to his puppets as if they are real people and his friends. He sees himself as merely a vessel so people can hear his puppets. To Kiyoshi, the dolls are real, and after talking with him, Tomoya and Akira suspect that this could be a coping mechanism for him to cope with some form of trauma in his past. I will definitely discuss what direction I think Kiyoshi's character is headed in a future video, but for the topic of this video, I don't think Kiyoshi is the mastermind or connected to the killing game. I think his talent can be a bit of a red herring since it's easy to think a puppeteer is more nefarious since many people find puppets creepy and with a common synonym for a manipulator being a puppet master. But I don't think Kiyoshi's character will go in that direction. I personally think Kiyoshi will meet an early fate in about chapter 2 or 3 so he will be going in BRAIN THE SIZE OF A GODDAMN PEANUT! After him is Kioran Morishita, the ultimate con artist. First, it is important to note that in his introduction and on the Heartless to See website, it's implied that Kioran could possibly be just an alias for this character and he keeps a lot of secrets from everyone. His most notorious con was scamming 1 billion yen from a clothing company, in which he explains that the company was underpaying its workers and treating them very poorly. It's also important to note, since I've mentioned the theme of prestige presence in the story of Heartless to See, that Kioran is one of the only characters in the game that 
that didn't go to a prestigious school, and in his case, he didn't even go through the traditional education system. While Kyoran on the surface seems like an all-around good guy, I am a little suspicious of him. First of all, he is the only student with a law-breaking talent other than our protagonist, and he also seemingly knows about Akira's double life. Second, he is incredibly skilled at reading people and sensing lies, which for one, could be very useful in the class trials, and two, is a scary skill to have in a death game. Going back to Kiran's motives as a con man, he says that he doesn't do his work only out of the kindness and generosity of his heart, but never reveals his ulterior motives, which is quite suspicious. What's important to the topic of this video is that his motives are closely tied with serving justice by any means necessary. If you go back to what I said during Izanami's section, Kiran's motives start to line up with what I believe are the EOS Institute's motivations for starting the killing game. Since the EOS Institute can find basically any information at their fingertips, tips including Kioran's identity and Akira's job as a hitman, they likely know of Kioran's motivations for his cons and could have scouted him out to enact the death game for the sake of justice. There's also another theory that I want to drop here that I literally just came up with. If these hints about Kirin Morishita being an alias end up becoming true, I think I might have a clue to what his real name is. Well, more just his last name. I believe that Kirin is secretly in the Morita family. Now I may be reaching a bit and using what I like to call N and gets its logic, but look at Shion and Tomoya, and then look at Kioran. Don't their hair colors look strikingly similar? Before anybody says, but Ocean, why doesn't Kioran have Troy from High School Musical 2 s bright blue eyes like Shion and Tomoya? Well, we haven't seen Shion and Tomoya's mom yet, who is heavily implied to be among the family members that were kidnapped alongside the Ultimates like Akira's brother Hitoshi. I will touch on this a bit more with my theories for Shion and Tomoya, but I believe at least one of them will become a killer in the story and then once they are executed, the mastermind will let their mom go. And it would not surprise me if their mom has the same pale greenish yellow eyes as Kioran. Additionally, we don't know Kiaran's birthday, so it could be possible that his birthday could also be February 26th, just like Shion and Tomoya. While Tomoya is being set up to have a character arc around being the disregarded, less liked sibling, I think it would be really interesting if another Morita sibling was thrown into the mix through Kioran, especially considering how Tomoya acted around him in the prologue. While this part went a little off track with my newest theory, let's go back to the topic of this video. Since I believe the EOS Institute and the police are behind the killing game, Kioran's motives fit perfectly with the clear themes of justice present in the death game, even if there's more nefarious intentions behind him. Additionally, Kiron's reaction to the first co-model being destroyed by Katsuhiko is quite odd. While everyone else is either worried about if Katsuhiko is okay or why Ko's scream sounded so human-like, Kiron slyly says, oh dear, almost like he was annoyed by one of the co-models being destroyed. Also, it's important to note that Kiyoran has a very similar sprite to Izanami's from her introduction when Tomoya asks him what his other motives are. He also gives this very creepy laugh. <laughs> So yeah, there's a lot of evidence pointing to Kioran being a lot more sinister than he lets on. For the reasons I've been babbling about, Kioran is my second strongest candidate for the mastermind or traitor, and thus is going in the devil. Another thing I wanted to mention really quickly is during Ko's introduction, the only two characters he refers to by name are Izanami and Kirin, which makes them look even more suspicious. Up next is Atome Hanayama, the ultimate manga artist. Atome's manga series have become very successful, but her cramped schedule causes her to lose sleep and get irritated. In her introduction, she states that her anger stems from her judgmental classmates who are clearly wealthy and stuck up based on how she describes them. It's also clear that Atome was likely bullied by these classmates, which caused her to have an inferiority complex at times, but she occasionally gets a superiority complex as well, which is likely a defense mechanism for her to try to assert her self-worth. Based on how she describes these classmates, it's evident that Atome is on a different page, pun intended, she's a manga artist, hehe. <laughs> she's on a different page from the other characters in regards to the theme of prestige in the story. She's seemingly just a regular teenager instead of a lot of the students who have incredibly wealthy and prestige-filled backgrounds. I think Atome's perspective in the investigations, class trials, and any other moments that occur in the killing game will be insightful, and I think she will make it pretty far in the story. I could absolutely see her surviving unless she becomes a mid to late game victim. With her possibilities for character development taken into consideration, I don't see Atome being connected to the killing game. Thus, she's going in the category named after her most iconic line, Brain the size of a goddamn peanut! 
Next is Rei Fukuno, the ultimate Otako. In terms of the consensus from the fans, everyone either thinks Rei will be the first victim, one of the victims in the double murder trial, or there is a very slim minority that believe that Rei could be the traitor if Izanami is the mastermind because of both of their connections with the Divine. However, I am among the group that believe Rei will likely be killed in the double murder trial. I think Rei will be important for the first couple chapters, especially considering the theme of prestige in the story, and Rei is on both ends of that spectrum since she didn't get her education from a prestigious school, but she does have a bit of a god complex like some of the characters more on the privileged side. However, I don't think she is involved in the killing game. Since some people do believe she's a part of the game, I'm putting her in See You Eat the Toaster, This Theory is Toast, since I don't think Rei is the mastermind or a traitor. Up next is Satoru Tachibana, the ultimate historian. I briefly touched on my theory about his character that in a trial, he will be revealed to be a grotesquely obsessed fan of one of the famous characters like Akira, Cho, or Bonnie. Because of my thoughts behind his character, I see him not being the mastermind or traitor and instead being an early story killer, specifically in either chapter 2 or 3. While I can understand why some might suspect Satoru as the mastermind or traitor because of his very academic-based talent, I mean, you all know my suspicion towards historians if you You've seen my Prodigy Eden's Garden video, but I personally don't believe Satoru's character art will go in the mastermind direction, more in the kind of unsettling character but he dies right after he reveals his true intentions direction. I will definitely discuss my theory on Satoru's character arc in upcoming videos, but for now he's going in BRAIN THE SIZE OF A GODDAMN PEANUT! Next is one half of the Marita twins, also known as the Angels of Japan, Shion Marita, the ultimate criminologist. In the prologue, Shion has been set up to be a very important character in the story. As the sister of Tomoya, who has been set up as the support character of Heartless Deceit, Shion is incredibly kind and optimistic towards everyone. She's honestly even more of a supportive character than Tomoya as she encourages everyone to not give up and gives them hope that they'll all be able to escape the killing game together. Additionally, Shion doesn't recall ever being the ultimate criminologist and has no memories of doing any work related to criminology as much as Tomoya insists that that's her ultimate title. In my previous video about Heartless Deceit, I mentioned the popular theory that Shion and Tomoya's talents were swapped, so if you want to hear a more in-depth analysis of that theory, I recommend you watch that video, but to be brief, there's a theory that Shion is actually the ultimate therapist and Tomoya is the ultimate criminologist and somehow their titles got swapped, which I do believe this theory is true. There's also a theory that Shion's memories of her talent were wiped because of how useful being a criminologist would be in the killing game, but I personally don't believe that's the reason because there are a lot of talents in this group that could be useful in the investigations or class trials. For instance, Katsuhiko's public speaking and debate skills, Satoru's intelligence as a historian, Hide and Takechi's physical strength, Kyoran's ability to read people and tell when they're lying, even Rei's talent as an otaku could mean she'd be able to speak with a chapter's victim as a spirit. Or, you know, the literal hitman? In regards to how Xion's role in the story will play out, I think all of the Marita family in the story will be quite important to how the story of Heartless Deceit will go, but Xion's fate is the most up in the air for me. Since Tomoya is the sport character, it's most likely that he will either survive or make it very late in the game and then die in chapter 5. For their father Isao, as he is investigating the kidnappings of the Ultimates, including his own children, it's likely that he will intrude in the death game in a late chapter and will likely die. For Xion, her fate and role is a bit harder to pin down. A lot of fans suspect that she will be an early game killer, especially the first one. Having the bubbly, optimistic, charming girl who has been labeled one of the angels of Japan die in the very first chapter would be incredibly despairing, especially for Tomoya and later for Isao to find out, and I honestly think something similar will happen. As I mentioned, I think Cho will be the first killer, and while I think Xion will still be a killer, I predict she will be executed in the late stage of the death game, likely in chapter 5, which will lead to the reveal that the twins talents were swapped, and the Kiran Marita theory if that ends up being true. However, because I see her optimism and hope as authentic, I don't see Xion being the mastermind or traitor. I think it would be interesting if the Marita twins were put into the killing game as a test for Isao, and it was revealed that he betrayed the EOS Institute and the police at one point, which could also explain his connection to Hanako as figured out by Denshi at the end of the prologue. Because of the prestige of the Institute and the connections between the students, with two or possibly more of them being siblings, the Maritas have to be in the killing 
killing game for a very specific reason, likely due to their father being the Commissioner General of the Police. If the Mastermind or Traitor are who I think they are with Izunami and Kyoran, the Moritos are likely in the death game to send a message about justice to Isao and the Japanese public who labeled them as angels. And also if the Kyoran Morita theory ends up being true, this adds even more layers to everything. Getting back on track to the topic of this video, because of everything, I don't think Shion is the Mastermind or Traitor, but because of her potential relevance to the plot, she's gonna sit comfortably in C, Yui the Toaster, this theory is toast. So fun fact, our next character was the first character not only that I learned about from Heartless to see, but also the first character who I saw speculated as the mastermind. Tomoya Morita, the ultimate therapist, is clearly set up as the support character to Akira in the story as he is nearly in every scene with her as they explore the area they are now in. However, Tomoya isn't the kind of character you would expect to be the support character in the death game genre. He comes off as full of himself and sometimes a little hot-headed. However, it's clear that we will learn a lot more about Tomoya and why he is the way he is, as shown from how he responds to the fact that no one knows who he is and by his heated screaming match with Yumeo, it's evident that Tomoya is actually quite insecure deep down and doesn't like being compared to his twin sister. He also evidently has quite a bit of trauma, some of it being related to gum violence, and he doesn't alleviate his own issues very well. Some fans of Heartless to See believe that Tomoya could possibly be more nefarious than he appears, especially considering his connections to the police and the possibility that he is behind the swapping of his and Shion's talents. However, I see Tomoya's character going in more of a positive character arc, with him opening up to Akira about his family life, his relationship about Shion and his father, and then him learning coping skills to heal. I could also see Akira growing closer to Tomoya and if her second talent isn't outed by Izanami or someone else like Hiyoran or maybe even Ko, I could see Akira telling Tomoya first as they build trust. While I can understand why people would be suspicious of Tomoya since he's connected to the main and side stories like Akira, but I personally see his character going on a good character arc, so he's going in see Yui the Toaster, the serious toast, right next to his sister. Next is Takechi Yanamoto, the ultimate weightlifter. He believes that the only way to achieve success is through hard work, which shows where he lies on the theme of prestige and how that applies to academics and life in the story. He's more on the side against the prestigious schools and attitudes, as he's proud of his ultimate title because he views his body as the product of all his hard work and dedication. While he oftentimes is kind of an angry and loud brute, he does have a protective and kind side and I really hope we see more of his positive and upbeat side, especially since the creator said that Takechi's hidden talent is being really good at makeup and said that he could do drag makeup if he had the time. Just for, for saying that, yeah, for spilling. Yeah. I think Takechi will be more important to the daily life sections of the story and will be the protective figure that some of the characters may need in the story, but I for one don't really see him survive and two, don't see him being involved in the killing game. For these reasons, he's going in brain the size of a goddamn peanut! And lastly, for the students in the killing game is Yumeo Arakawa, the ultimate forensic pathologist who, as you can tell, I am so normal about! Yumeo Arakawa, for one, as I've mentioned before, has one of the most unique and useful talents in a death game. As forensic pathologists study corpses who passed away suddenly and or violently, Yumeo's insight on the investigations and class trials will be very interesting. He's also extremely standoffish, rude, and unfiltered, as seen by his argument with Tomoya in the prologue. However, the only person who actively wants to be around him is Izanami, which, considering my theories about her, that's already a red flag. In Yumeo and Izanami, backstory comic, The Coward Among the Gods, Yumeo struggles standing up for others and himself and views himself as a coward. However, Izanami encourages him to join the student council, which we know that he did. So his connection to Izanami, the most suspicious member of the cast, is already suspicious. Also his body of work, pun intended, being with the dead is equally suspicious. However, I really want Yumeo to survive and get some character development. This may be my biases getting in the way, but I want to learn more about him, especially with his connection to Izanami and what led him to become the black-hearted prince that he has been labeled as. Because of the suspicious parts of his character, he's gonna go in... <laughs> But you all don't understand how intrigued I am to see where his character will go. We are now done with the 16 Ultimate students, so now it's time to move on to the side story. Starting with Akira's best friend and the former Ultimate hacker, Denshi Shigenobu. 
Denshi Shikanobu is a childhood friend of Akira's, a former Ultimate student, and used to work for the EOS Institute. In his bio, he says that as the anonymous hacker Yon, he is notorious for exposing corrupted individuals, and even his bio questions if he has any involvement in the killing game and or the awards ceremony. In the flashback at the start of the side story part of the prologue, Denshi explains that the EOS Institute awards crime-related talents like him being a hacker or Akira being a hitman as a way to encourage people to stop doing what they're good at and utilize their skills for the betterment of society, and then EOS can pat themselves on the back for reforming them at the end of the day. He also reveals that EOS Institute is able to get such secret information, but he says he's not the reason that EOS knows about Akira being a hitman for the Yakuza. As far as we've been shown, Denshi is trying to investigate the killing game to save Akira. However, there are many, many clues that point to Denshi not being the chill, kind hermit that he appears to be. First off, and most importantly, he designed and built Ko, the mascot of the killing game, to be the secure security and mascot for the EOS Institute, and he designed the android after Hanako, the mysterious girl with connections to the Yakuza who died a few years before the events of Heartless Deceit. Second, while Akira has been his best friend since childhood, there's a part of me that believes that some of what he told Akira could be lies, especially with how EOS discovered her secret life. Lastly, if you consider my other theories, Denshi's mention of EOS Institute's desire to reform criminals and then reward themselves connects back to the corrupt sense of justice that I think is EOS's motive motivation for creating the killing game. Also, Denshi literally worked for EOS Institute and knows the types of things they can pull off. For these reasons, I believe Denshi could be involved in the killing game, so he is the first person going in that one Izanami sprite. Second in this order on the website is Ryuji Himura, the current chairman of the Himura clan. We don't know much about any of the current Himura clan as none of them appear in the prologue, but gathering from the voice acting trailer, Ryuji holds a lot of pride to his family name and enjoys the finer things in life as he is confused by Denji's instant noodles filled pantry. He also says probably my favorite line of text in the series, I am not sure what a 2D girl is. This guy touches grass. He may even touch moss! I'm sure we will learn a lot more about him as the story progresses and his connection to his brother Ryusei, who we've seen in Akira's memories, and also his connection to Hanako. He seems like a really fascinating character that will help a lot with Isao and Denji investigating Akira's whereabouts. However, because I've stated that I think the EOS Institute and the police are behind the killing game and are going to try to pin their crimes on the Hamura clan, Ryuji and most of the Yakuza characters are going in BRAIN THE SIZE OF A GODDAMN PAYNOT! Well, I'm getting ahead of my Myself, I'm gonna put both Momoka and Hirotaka in the same category as Ryuji. Momoka and Hirotaka are interesting characters, but I don't see them helping out in any way to the killing game. They both seem extremely loyal to the Himura clan, and I don't think their loyalty is even a little bit with the EOS Institute, so they're staying in BRAIN THE SIZE OF A GODDAMN PAYNOT! Last in the Himura clan is Keisuke Fujinuma, and I'm putting them separately because I am a little bit suspicious of them. First and foremost, their subtitle is Average Cutthroat, and for a story that is heavily focused on exceptional talents and eccentric characters, the word average had to have been used for a reason. Second, they are a former business worker, but they never say what company or organization. It would be fascinating if they had previously worked for the EOS Institute. In addition, one of Keisuke's lines in the voice actor trailer has them accusing someone, likely Denchi, of having an ulterior motive, which very much reminds me of what Kyoran said in his introduction about his motives for his cons. Finally, Keisuke's bio states that they had a significantly important relationship with the previous chairman of the Hamura clan as they appointed Keisuke. Their bio also mentions that they become a completely different person when they feel threatened, compared to their extremely calculated composure. Also, they have a similar sprite to Izanami and Kyoran's unhinged sprites shown in Momoka's day off. If someone from the Hamura clan ends up being someone working behind the scenes of the killing game, chances are it will be Keisuke. Their no-nonsense and analytical mindset along with the eerie concluding statement of their bio and their connection with the previous chairman of the Hamura clan places them in Up next is Father, father wait, which I leave, leave to be on my, my own. own, aka Shion and Tomoya's father, Isao Morita. In the story, Isao is working alongside Denshi to find his children and possibly also his ex-wife if she got kidnapped in a similar fashion to Akira's brother. As the commissioner general of the police, he is tied with both the police and the EOS Institute. However, I truly don't see any reason as to why if he were involved with the killing game, why would he put his children in the killing game unless it's revealed that he's an absolute sadist with no morals, but I don't see his character going in that direction. Whereas I can maybe see a reason for why Denshi would put his childhood friend in the killing game as some kind of 
of test. I can't think of a reason Isao would intentionally put Shion and Tomoya in danger for the means of a death game. Isao will definitely play a massive role in the discovery of the secrets behind these characters in the killing game, but I don't think he is the mastermind. Because of his likely plot importance, he will be sitting in See You the Toaster, the Serious Toast for now. Aw, uh, he's with his kids! It's like a little family portrait. Next is Karu Yasunaga, the chief superintendent of the Criminal Affairs Bureau. Karu takes her job incredibly seriously and has an indestructible sense of justice. She believes it is her mission to eradicate all crime in Japan, and she has become known for being the reason that Yakuza activity has decreased in the past few years. I mentioned in my last video about Heartless Deceit that it's very likely that Karu was the one who killed Hanako before the events of the story, and she believes that Hanako's death stopped all of the Yakuza activity. However, with this in mind, I think Karu was somehow involved in the killing game behind the scenes. With my theory that the motivations of whoever the mastermind ends up being are to prove a point of a corrupt view of justice, Kairu's views on everything fits nearly perfectly. I think in the side story, Kairu will be a bit of a roadblock or nuisance for Denshi and Isao, and while it may come across like self-righteousness, it's actually to avoid the reveal that she's a part of the mastermind's plans. I definitely think Kairu is involved in the killing game in one way or another, and she'll be how we learn about the outside influences of the game, and also what exactly Exactly happened to Hanako. So, Karu Yasunaga is going in that one Izanami sprite. After Karu is Kumiko Arase, the founder of the EOS Institute. At the start of Heartless Deceit, Kumiko has allegedly gone missing and there's no leads on where she is. While I don't know exactly where she is, I do think Kumiko is also involved in the killing game whether she's completely in control of it or not. I think it would be really fascinating if she was just hiding in the statue of herself, controlling Ko and overseeing the killing game. If she is in control of the killing game, it's very likely that she has a pair of second eyes in the killing game through a traitor, likely Izanami or Kiara. However, I want to go down the path of Izanami. Kumiko's subtitle in her bio is Theia, which alone means goddess or divine. Izanami in The Coward Among the Gods is called the goddess and her subtitle is goddess of creation. It's likely that Kumiko sees a bit of herself in Izanami and she chose her to be her eyes into the killing game. As I've stated all throughout the video, the EOS Institute is likely behind the killing game to prove a corrupt point of justice and or prestige and talent, and Kumiko is likely the charging force of these views, which is shown in her bio. She is described as idealistic and extremely influential, but also incredibly narcissistic. She clearly has a strong view on her institute, probably strong enough to make the ultimates hurt each other to prove her point and stomp out any naysayers, with her dislikes even saying, those who don't agree with her. For these reasons, I believe Kumiko Arase is a strong contender for the mastermind, and she's going straight up to the devil. And lastly is the unknown character at the end of the voice actor trailer, aka the devil. I already touched on him quite a bit in Izanami's section, but episode 4, Above the Yellow Spring, basically confirms that Izanami and the devil are cousins, and the devil rejected the talent that Izanami now has received, whatever that ends up being. Because of everything I said in Izanami's section, I don't think there is a likely possibility that the devil is going to be evil. If the EOS Institute ends up being the ones behind the killing game, why would the devil help them if he rejected the invitation? I think the devil could end up being a vigil ante in the main story that ends up helping Denshi and Isao crack the code of the EOS Institute and expose their corruption and involvement in the killing game as well as trying to save Izanami, his cousin. AKA he's Aroto Akaji, the ultimate vigil ante of Brave Ding and Rob the Coward's Paradise. The subversion that the characters with names associated with beautiful goddesses in Kumiko and Izanami are actually really corrupted, whereas the guy who calls himself the devil is just an anti-establishment vigil ante would be very interesting. After the events of Above the Yellow Spring, I don't suspect the devil as the mastermind or to be involved in the killing game at all, but he will appear suddenly and try to expose EOS for their corrupted morals, actions, and that they are behind the killing game. There will likely be a lot more revealed about the devil and his role in this mess, but for now I'll put him in C. You eat the toaster, this theory is toast. And those are my thoughts and theories about who could be the mastermind of Dingaramba Heartless Deceit. Please check out this series if you haven't yet and if it piqued your interest because everyone involved is working so hard on it. If you liked this video, make sure to give it a like and subscribe to this channel and make sure to turn on the bell for notifications. Comment down below any theories if you have them or your thoughts on my theories and I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you so much.